Hello and welcome to the Office of State Archaeology's 2018 lecture series. Throughout the year, OSA will be hosting speakers each month to present archaeological research conducted throughout the state. All lectures are free and open to the public, and this year we'll be live streaming the lectures as well, and afterwards posting them to YouTube. So keep an eye out for that. Today it's my honor to introduce uh, our July speaker, Mr. Sean Patch. Sean is a senior archaeologist and geophysical specialist and branch manager of the Greensboro Office of New South Associates. Mr. Patch has received his uh, bachelor's degree in anthropology from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and his uh, MA in anthropology from Eastern New Mexico, State Univer uh, Eastern New Mexico University. Uh, he's a reg registered professional archaeologist and has worked as extensively in the southeastern United States as well as Mexico. Today, Sean will be presenting a talk entitled, From Grave Markers to Unmarked Graves, Archaeological Insights of Historic Cemeteries. Sean will discuss archaeological insights into various historic cemeteries within North Carolina and beyond. And this present presentation includes examples using ground penetrating radar to identify unmarked graves and to help better identify and define cemetery boundaries, as well as data from other various marker inventories. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Sean Patch. Am I, am I on? All right. Well, thank you, David, for that introduction. I, I really appreciate it. Again, my name is Sean Patch. I work with New South Associates in Greensboro. It's a, it's a great honor to be here today, and I appreciate the opportunity. I'm going to be talking for the next few minutes about cemeteries. I'm going to start with some of the work that we've done in working with the above ground resources in cemeteries, that is the markers specifically, and then intertwine among that work we've done with ground penetrating radar or GPR to identify unmarked graves and cemetery boundaries. I, the older I get and the farther I progress in my career, the more I revert to Archaeology 101, which is time and space. And it, the, the basic principles of time and space apply to all archaeology. What I like about cemeteries is that they illustrate those concepts very well. Cemeteries are unique because they have specific dates. That is, we have features in the, in the ground that have dates on them. They have demographic data on them. There are common patterns in marker form, type, and material that are, that are evident through time. Uh, the changing styles can be tracked through time and space. So again, it illustrates that concept very well. And one of my favorite articles that I come back to a few times a year is one by uh, James Deeds and Edwin Deplison about um, New England gravestones and, and um, marker studies of, of the funerary art that was on the markers and how those changed through time. So that, that concept is guiding some of the things I'm talking about today. This is a, an excerpt from that publication, which is a classic in archaeological literature. On the left, you see a couple of different styles that are common in New England gravestones. Those do extend out beyond that. But in the earliest period, you get this, these death's head types. Then it switches to the cherub, which is a softening of the Puritan attitudes toward death. And then beginning around the turn of the 19th century, you see the urn and willow pattern. Over here, I have this, these battleship curves in here because they illustrate the time and space aspect of cemetery markers in particular. But this will also relate to some of the examples I'll show in a few minutes. What I like about these is you can see these, these classic battleship curves where it's illustrating the concept of style and popularity through time. So we see that a style becomes popular or is popular for a certain period of time. It tends to fade. As it fades, another style becomes more popular. That one may fade, and then another style pops in. It applies very well to the, to, the, to the art that's on markers in New England gravestones, but it also applies to other aspects or other attributes as well. It can apply to the material type. It can apply to the material form, uh, whether or not there's an epitaph present. So there's, there are lots of different attributes that one can look at and plot these kinds of battleship curves. I, by way of background, grew up in, in the small town of Springfield, Vermont. I was born and raised there. And I, as a kid, I spent a lot of time roaming through cemeteries because my dad's an antique dealer, and so we were always doing those kinds of things. As an adult and as an archaeologist, I recognize now that cemeteries have a wealth of data and that being from New England, I can go out and see these cemeteries firsthand. So I have a couple of examples here of similar marker types from two different cemeteries. Actually, I'm sorry, those are the same cemetery in Rockingham, Vermont. What you see here is the, is the cherub. So you, there's a face. It has wings attached to it. It's on slate, which is a very common material for that particular time, late 18th century. And then a couple of other examples. This is from a cemetery in, in the town next to me where, where uh, I actually did some work this summer. Went through with the, with the GPS system and mapped all the markers. And then I had volunteers who worked with me using mobile phones to record all of the marker information that was on them, as well as taking a photograph. 
And the end result of that, which I haven't finished yet, but which I will at some point, will be a map in, in Google Maps that will have all the marker locations, and you'll be able to click on those, and then the attribute data will pop up along with the photograph of that marker. So the, in that case, each marker has a unique identifier, which allows you to go in and actually look at the attribute data underlying that. So my talk today starts with the above ground, that is the marker st types that we've looked at in different cemeteries, and then I'll intertwine, as I said, some of the GPR work. Oftentimes what we're asked to do when we work in cemeteries is to make a map of the cemetery and then make, do an inventory of the markers that are there. So I have a few examples of work we've done, and then we also are asked oftentimes to come in and identify unmarked graves or the boundaries of cemeteries. Uh, just a couple of slides here on GPR. It is a common application for cemeteries. One of the questions I often get asked is, why GPR? Well, GPR works well because it's non-invasive. We're not disturbing the ground in any way. Uh, we want to use it in situations where excavations are not possible. So cemeteries are a, a good example of that. It tends to provide comprehensive coverage over a, over a particular survey area. That is, it's producing data that we can look at in three dimensions. It's relatively cost effective and very efficient. And this last bullet point here, it's sort of sciency. That a lot of folks see, recognize GPR as a, as a high-tech instrument, and it, it does have that appeal. And there's lots of public interest, certainly, in, in that technology. I'll just throw this in here because I want to illustrate what GPR is not or what it can't do. And thanks to Hollywood, many folks have these perceptions of what GPR is. These are excerpts from, this is CSI, I believe, and this is Bones. So you see the instrument here in the background in both cases. But what you see here is an image of the actual instrument that we use. But what they've shown here is the outline of a skeleton. And I can tell you that in 15 years of working in cemeteries, I have yet to see a skeleton. It just it doesn't work that way. But this is Hollywood, and it's nice to start with this to show what GPR can't actually do. So what can it do, or how does it work? Well, GPR is a remote sensing technique that sends electromagnetic energy into the ground, and the energy bounces back off buried objects, and it allows us to collect 3D data that we can then use to make a map of the subsurface. What kinds of things can we identify? We can identify lots of different objects in GPR. Obviously, we can identify graves, buried utilities, buried wall foundations, other types of buried archaeological features. And what I have here is a basic example. This is how the energy is propagated from the antenna along the surface. This is a shot of what the system looks like. This is a, an individual profile from one pass of the GPR. So what, and then this is a 3D slices. So basically, if you think about a, a box or a cube, We've then sliced the data set horizontally at different depths to see what types of features, if any, there may be. And that allows us to get the depth of, of certain anomalies as well. One of the important points that we do when working with GPR is we want to look at not only the 3D data, that is this data set here, but to look at the individual profiles. That's particularly important for cemeteries because grave features are very subtle relative to other types of features and, and other types of archaeological features. They're hard to see. OK, so geophysical survey and archaeology, I, I, a few years ago, came up with this, this idea of a Venn diagram to think about how different people conceive of geophys in the archaeological community. Oftentimes, we're asked sim simple questions such as, where should I dig? Somebody wants to know where something is in the ground so they can either avoid it, say maybe in a cemetery, or if it's a researcher who wants to know where certain types of features are, they may want to know where they are so they can excavate those. That's what I would refer to as the most basic application of GPR or geophysical survey in archaeology. Other types of more advanced studies are talking about the landscape or looking at feature patterning or site structure or developing cultural interpretations from geophysical data sets alone. That is, either with no archaeology to support that or, in some cases, limited archaeology to help refine the interpretations that we can make from GPR or geophysical data. And the last application is that my company in particular has done a lot of work recently where we use geophysical data sets to help support National Register nominations, that is, actually use the data sets as primary drivers to nominate a particular site to the National Register, or more commonly to actually help support a recommendation of eligibility in terms of National Register nominations. Okay, okay so cemeteries. That I only have a few case studies here today, but it's based on on more than 50 cemeteries that I have worked on personally in the southeast, lots in North and South Carolina, several in Georgia, a couple in Florida, a few in Tennessee. Cemeteries are, are the most difficult resource type for GPR applications because, as I mentioned a minute ago, the, the features themselves are very subtle relative to other buried objects in the ground. They're very hard to see. Part of that is because the, 
It depends on factors such as when the person was interred, what type of burial container they were in, how long have they been in the ground. In other words, somebody who was buried in, say, the 1780s in a burial shroud, that person's been in the ground decomposing for the past 250 years. That's a very subtle feature when it's compared to someone who was buried in a metal casket inside a concrete vault in the 1950s. In terms of the contrast in the ground, those two objects or those two features look very different. In addition to that, when we're talking about cemeteries, people who, who are, we're working with have high attachment to the cemeteries. They're emotionally invested in it. They have, they have certain outcomes they would like to see. So a lot of the time when I'm working with folks in cemeteries, I try to understand what it is they want to get out of it, what is it they want to learn, and help educate them about what GPR can or can't do so that they understand the limitations, because there are limitations to what GPR can do. It's a great instrument, but it doesn't work 100% in every situation. With cemeteries in general, one of the points that I'll come back to you toward the end of today, too, is that what you see in a cemetery when you walk in one today is almost never what you get. And this is often a hard point for me to, to, to convey to certain people in that we have this image that when we look at a cemetery that appears to be well-maintained because it's mowed and it's cared for and people are out there on a regular basis, that's great. But what we've seen from the numerous examples we've looked at archaeologically is that what's below the ground is actually quite different in most cases than what you see above ground. There are situations where the markers have been moved or the markers have been removed or markers were never placed to begin with or maybe... Um, Something someone is marked with a wooden marker or a temporary metal funeral home marker, those get lost. So in, in every single cemetery I've worked in, without exception so far, what I see on the surface does not match what's actually underground. There are usually many more graves in a cemetery than there are from what's indicated by the markers. So some of the running themes that we see in some of the cemetery work we do are that we're often asked to look at do conditions assessments of the markers and cemetery in general for preservation activities or to help develop management plans. We will often map the markers, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, and then link those with the, with the mapping and then the underlying attributes so that people can, can conduct demographic research with those. We identify unmarked graves. We define cemetery boundaries. I've been asked a few times over the years to identify new burial space in a cemetery. That is, uh, entity or a congregation knows that they need, they need more burial space. They look around and they see open space on the surface because there are no markers there. So that, again, they have this concept that that means it's clear when they know from previous experience that oftentimes they, they bury people in those locations and it turns out someone's already home, that there was somebody there to begin with. So we've been asked several times to help identify portions of cemeteries that could be used for additional burial space. We've also been asked to help identify unmarked graves so that people can commemorate those individuals by placing markers today. And it also assists with long-term management plans and preservation plans. So the case studies I have here today, I'm talking about a couple from South Carolina. I have two from, three from North Carolina and one from Georgia. And these illustrate, well, there's some overlapping themes among them, but there are some differences as well, which is why I chose those. The first one I have here is the B.F. Randolph Cemetery in Columbia, South Carolina. This is uh, right off I-26. This is downtown Columbia, the historic district. This is a African-American cemetery that, was, uh, that began right, right after the Civil War in Reconstruction period. We did two separate phases of work here. We started with a marker map and inventory of all the markers, and then we came in a few years later and conducted a GPR survey of certain areas. In the first case, the, the point of the marker map and inventory was to help a local nonprofit understand what the resource base looked like. What condition was the cemetery in? How many markers did they have? What condition were the markers in individually? And then longer term, they were interested in more burial space, which is why they asked us to work on the GPR survey. On the right here, I know this is hard to see at the scale, but is a, is a detailed map of all of the markers, all of the copings, all of the other cemetery features that were in that, that are in that cemetery today. So that consisted of a total station mapping, which you see me over here on the left, and with my assistant here, we individually mapped all of the graves and all the other features. We now do this with, an, with a GPS system that has sub-centimeter accuracy, so it's a one-person operation, which is nice. And then on the right, this is me collecting data with the GPR system. Again, in this case, we mapped all the markers. Uh, we inventoried all those markers and put all the attribute data into a database and, and linked those to a map, and then came back a few years later and conducted the GPR survey. On the marker side, though, I have this as these are marker materials by decade. What I was interested in doing here, if you recall those, that slide I showed you earlier of the battleship curves from the New England cemeteries, 
I wanted to see if this particular data set could illustrate some of those patterns. And it does. I know this, this slide is hard to see, but if you imagine turning this on its side, you would, you, you're looking at one half of a battleship curve. And in my next slide, I'll show what that looks like. But what you see here basically is that beginning in the 1860s, marble was the most common material type. It was very popular. It slowly trailed off into the 1920s. As, granite, as marble trailed off in popularity, granite became more popular until it's the most commonly used type today. It's hard to see on here, but there's a, there's a bar in yellow, which is for concrete. And there's a period of time in this particular cemetery where concrete markers were, were popular relative to the other types. And what we found from doing the archival research is that it was oftentimes done as an inexpensive way to mimic marble. So people would produce concrete markers at home, or they had a vernacular producer who would make those for them, and they would paint them white to look like marble to emulate that. So it was an inexpensive way to emulate what, mar what marble looked like. And here's, the, here's the, an actual battleship curve of, the, of that data set looking at the marker material type. So marble here, granite, concrete, and other. It's, there were a few different material types out there. And then the decades are over here. So what you see, again, I know the, the contrast isn't great, but you see that marble was the most common or the most popular type during the bulk of the 19th century. As that waned in popularity, granite gained in popularity, and it still is the most popular today. But you also see fairly well here the peaks of, of concrete. And just for comparison purposes is the image of the New England markers. Same thing with marker material type by, this is, I'm sorry, this is marker type by decade. I had to collapse some of the categories here because there are lots of variations in markers. So to make, the, make it meaningful, I broke this down into round top versus rectangular. But again, you see the similar pattern here where there's a, there's a round top markers were popular in the late 19th century. Rectangular and other types became more popular later on. This is also an interesting attribute, epitaphs by decade. This is not talking about the type of epitaph or what's on it, just presence, absence, simply. And this is, illustrates it fairly well that early on, that is in the late 19th century, the presence of an epitaph was fairly common. That waned in popularity, and then there are relatively fewer epitaphs as we get into the 20th century. On the GPR survey here, we did not survey the entire cemetery. We surveyed small areas that, were, that we would, could use to be representative samples of what we expected the results to be in the rest of the cemetery. And these were the most, these were the areas that looked like the most open when you walk out there today. That is, they have the fewest markers, they have the most green space. Therefore, the assumption that many folks had was that we have space available for burials here. It turns out that that's actually not the case. And what you see in red here are unmarked graves that are not visible in any way on the surface. And there are many more there than anyone anticipated. And we ended up making a recommendation based on that, that that cemetery is essentially full. I didn't, I didn't tell anybody that they couldn't bury folks there. I simply presented the scientific evidence and said, from our perspective in these areas that we have looked at, there are many more graves here than are visible from the surface indications. And encourage those folks to think carefully about whether or not they should continue to bury people there. In the end, they decided to close that cemetery to future interments. So that one is, that one is now no longer available. We also look, developed a preservation plan using, developed a historic context. We looked at oral histories to help document the unknown graves. We made recommendations about erosion control, plot and marker restoration, developing a long-term master slash maintenance plan, and then obviously the unmarked, extent of the unmarked graves. I was fortunate enough a few years ago to work on a cemetery project at Marine Corps Air Station Beaufort in Beaufort, South Carolina. In this case, we were asked to look at 11 different African-American cemeteries that spanned the antebellum and reconstruction periods. So I have a couple different maps here that show the locations of these cemeteries on modern mapping here, topographic mapping, aerial pho photograph. And I have a couple other maps here in a minute. But again, similar to Randolph, we did total station mapping. We did a marker inventory with, the, with photographs and demographic data, and then GPR areas and selected portions of the cemeteries to see what was, what was going on there. I love historic maps, like I'm sure many of you do in this room. Uh, they're, they're great. They're really insightful and informative. They tend to not georeference very well on, onto modern mapping. And I see some heads nodding out here. Someone else has experienced that as well. I like to show them, though, anyway, just because they do give some idea of landscape development and change through time. So an early map here from 1771. 1777, 1825, and what we noticed is as we go through time, the mapping becomes more accurate, which allows, them, allows us for better georeferencing today. 
just a few more examples of that. So I have a slide here that shows the different marker types. And I, I realize now over the years that there, there are no hard and fast rules about how markers are defined. And often folks, oftentimes many people will define them differently. In each case where we've done marker inventories, we have defined those categories in some way prior to going in the field so that when, when our folks are in the field recording the data, they will, they will use the attributes we've selected. So here's a few examples of the different types. These were for the Beaufort Cemetery specifically. There are ledger stones here, a tombstone. This is a military marker, few temporary funeral home markers. And then we have some displaced markers and a few, a few crypts here as well. A couple of examples here of how we use the dates on markers to look at how a cemetery may change through time. These were both began in the antebellum period. These were, they started as slave cemeteries. They were, they were used for freedmen after the Civil War. I, I know it's hard to see at this scale, but what we've done here is symbolize the marker by decade. So over here on this scale is the, um, is the decade. And I, red here is the earliest one. Actually, no, red is no date on this one. These are not the best examples to illustrate that concept. But the idea here is that you can, if, when you plot markers by decade, you can look at where they are in space, and you can, it allows you to say, OK, well, the oldest section of the cemetery is over here. And we can see how that cemetery may have grown or changed over time, just simply by plotting the dates on the markers in, in a GIS program. This, summit, this project was interesting to me personally because we were able to, to make some human connections between some of the interred folks who, whose markers we recorded and finding some actual records associated with them. So we have a population census schedule here, uh, death certificates, which actually were very useful in some cases because they have the name, in many cases, of the actual cemetery as it was named at the time the person was buried, and in many cases, even the funeral home. So that helped us, in this case, understand what the historic names of those cemeteries were, say, in 1920 or 1940. And they aren't necessarily the same name as they are today. We had one marker in particular from a, a man named Stephen Vineyard, who was an uh, African American. I was able to find his enlistment record with the, with the South Carolina Colored Regiment at the time of the Civil War, and then a record of his monument as well. So not necessarily straight up archaeological in this case, but it is nice, it's very rewarding to actually find these kinds of data sets with individuals whose, whose markers we've, we've walked around or, who've, or we've inventoried in some way. So in the Buford case, very similar recommendations in terms of what we, what we came up with. Uh, these cemeteries were largely overgrown. They're on a military installation today. Descendants still have access to those cemeteries. But because of the access issues, it's difficult to maintain them. And the military doesn't necessarily do much with them, aside from recognize that they're there. We recommended that they develop a maintenance plan to help remedy some of those deficiencies. We also recommended more comprehensive GPR survey, because we were looking at very small windows in each of these cemeteries. And we recognized from those results that applying GPR more broadly would produce more comprehensive data. Our recommendations for replacing some of the broken markers and restoring others filling the slump graves, and then really, in this case, making an, an effort to, out, to reach out to the local communities, because there are many descendants from these particular cemeteries who still live in this area. Elmwood Pinewood Cemetery is an example here from, from Charlotte, North Carolina. This was a project we worked on with the North Carolina DOT a few years ago. In this case, uh, DOT had a proposal at the time to expand the CSX rail corridor. And it's, I know you can't see the actual rail corridor here, but this is, this is it right here. And we had a five-acre study area to look at the potential impacts from that alternative, which ended up being tabled, hopefully, as a result of the work that we did here. We had three tasks. One was a marker inventory, the second was mapping, and the third was GPR survey. It just by now should sound familiar. This is the study area we looked at, adjacent to or parallel to the existing rail, rail corridor. And Elmwood Pinewood is listed on the National Register of Historic Places under multiple criteria. I don't recall all of them off the top of my head. I know it's A, A B, C. Is that correct, Paul? Yeah, OK, yeah. Okay. Aerial photographs showing the same study area here. This is the, the corridor that we looked at. One of the interesting things about this project is because of the way the alignment or the study area is laid out, it cross-cut different, different sections of that cemetery. Elmwood is historically the white section that was existed prior to seg during segregation. Pinewood was the African-American section. But in each of those, and I have a, a map here that I'll get to in just a moment, 
there were there were both pauper sections. So we had pauper sections in the historically white area, pauper sections in the American the African American area, and then we had what we refer to as paid sections, which is the, the non pauper area. So it, it really provided us a a great example to test and look at different variables in terms of not only how graves may have been treated by different ethnic groups, but how they may have been treated within those ethnic groups in terms of whether or not they could afford their own graves or they were being buried as, as paupers. So again, we define different marker types here. This gives you a good idea of, what we, of, the, of the variability in this particular section. My memory from Elmwood Pinewood is that the entire cemetery is dozens of acres and contains roughly 50,000 graves, give or take. I don't have the exact number, but it's a very large cemetery and it's in, in downtown Charlotte. So this is, map shows the different sections. In green here, this is the historically white sections, again, during segregation. What you see in blue is the African-American sections. And then within that, in Elmwood here, we're looking at, in the dark green, these are, these are lots where people were purchasing individual plots. The light green are the pauper sections. In blue here, darker blue is the purchased lots within the African-American section, and light blue was the pauper sections. So if you recall from that example I showed from, from Randolph Cemetery, where it was fairly easy to pick out the patterns of marker types, here there's a lot more variability. And I'm not going to try to call out every single one of these. This is where, we, in this particular slide, I have called out the different marker types, each, each individual marker type. But you can see fairly quickly that there are certain types that are more popular than others, and these are, these are headstones. Material type by decade, if you, again, recall from Randolph Cemetery where we had very clear, obvious patterns that we could see, the, the battleship curves and the popularity. It's not quite the same here, and that's largely because there's a lot more vari variability in terms of the material types that are out there. Bronze, concrete, granite, marble, metal, painted steel, pink granite, pink marble. So a lot, a lot more variation here. And then looking at some of the differences in, in the different sections, this is marble and granite, marble and red granite and blue. We don't have large data sets to compare between them, but you, you do get some idea of trends here. One outlier is in the Pinewood Potter's Field. There's obviously looks like there's 90% marble. That's true, but that's because there are only a handful of markers anyway. The, most of that area has unmarked graves in it. So that's somewhat skewed here in this particular section. Uh, markers and border plot, something else we looked at, not terribly informative other than in Elmwood, what we see in terms of the purchase plots is that those plots have some kind of boundary around them, maybe a coping of some sort or fences. That tends to be a fairly common attribute, not quite so much in the other sections. Looking at death date by decade, another attribute we can look at through time, it's fairly clear that in the 19-teens and 1920s, there was a spike, particularly in the Pinewood Potter's Field. Uh, again, that's somewhat skewed because there are only a handful of markers there. Looking at these data sets gives, gives you an idea of what types of questions you can ask if you have time and space. Time and space really are the key here. That's, that's the running theme for my, my talk today. A couple examples of how we apply GPR in this case. This is baby land, what, what the cemetery managers refer to as baby land. It's not a very elegant term, but that's what it's referred to in the records. What you see here is a map of the existing markers. This is, if you walked out there today on the ground, this is what you would see. After the GPR survey, this is actually what's in the ground. There are many, many more, mark, many, many more graves here than are indicated by the, by the markers on the surface. So I'll come back to that point that what you see is never what you, almost never what you get in terms of a cemetery. And particularly over here, there are, there are lots. And you can also tell, or I can tell because I've done this enough now, there are differences in the size of the anomalies, that these typically represent juveniles. So it tends to fit with the idea that this is baby land, where the Juveniles or, or um, young folks are buried in the pauper section. I mentioned earlier about how we look at both 3D data sets and individual profiles. Here are a couple profiles from Babyland specifically. And you see these ref hyperbolic reflections. This is typically what we see in terms of how a or a grave is imaged in the GPR profiles. And then these are, these are actually buried plot boundaries where something is buried below the ground. It's not, a, it's not an actual grave in that in that sense, but there's something there. And one point I hope you can see here is a difference in how these data are imaged. That for a grave, we typically see a hyperbolic reflection, and for other buried objects, they may look quite different. So in this case, in the banding, that tells me that we're looking at some kind of something with mass in the ground. And when you look at it in plan view, you can see that that's the outline of a, of a plot boundary. 
So one of the things that, that DOT was interested in was the, the number of potential graves in that study area. So again, recalling my, my, I'll keep harping on this theme about what you see is never what you get. If we only looked at the graves from the, from the existing markers, we would get 580. We had roughly 938 markers that showed up in the GPR data. These are not mutually exclusive, so it doesn't mean it's 580 plus 983. But then going through a series of steps, what we ultimately got to was an estimate, only an estimate of the total number of graves. That's after comparing the GPR results with the existing marker results. There are many cases where a marker does not have a corresponding anomaly or where there's an anomaly with no marker. So what we ended up with was our best estimate was that there were roughly 1,218 graves in that five-acre section along the CSX rail corridor. That's a lot of unmarked graves compared to the number of 580 markers that we had over here. It's more than double that. So hopefully that will reinforce the idea that what you see often is not what you get in a cemetery. And I, as a result of that, my understanding is that that alternative was discontinued from consideration. So it's not, it's not on the table anymore. But OK, moving on, I have another example from North Carolina. This is a Snow Creek Church Cemetery. I believe this is in Iredell County. Uh, we were asked in this case to come in and, and again, conduct a GPR survey. They were interested in finding additional burial space because there are lots of descendants in that area who want to be buried next to their ancestors. On the left here is an outline showing the area that we covered with the GPR. On the right is an inventory of the markers that we mapped within those sections. And I know you can't see it. It's OK. But it's symbolized, again, by decade over here. So what we see in, in the pinks here are roughly the mid-18th century. And the light blues are early, eight, early 19th century. So again, it, it gives you an idea of, of how a cemetery has changed or how it's developed through time. But keep, keep a mental image, if you can, of this one, because you see all these markers here. And then we get to the next slide. And I have the, the processed radar data over here. And I, I realize you can't pick out every single grave. I don't expect you to be able to do that from, from where you're sitting. But what you see here are some very good examples. These are marked graves, which is why they show up so well. What you're seeing here in these dark red areas, those are high amplitude reflections. That is, there's something in the ground, in this case, a grave, that's causing that energy to be reflected back. So these are very easy to, to pick out. You don't have to be an expert with GPR data to know what those look like. I could, I could take all of this out in the field, and we could go to a marked cemetery, and in 10 minutes, all of you would say, oh, yeah, I see it now. It's, it's really easy to pick those out. It's much harder to pick out the more subtle graves, and that's where going back and looking at the individual profiles is also critical to compare with the three-dimensional data that we have here. But so the, the, the big takeaway here is looking at the, the results of that GPR survey, what you see in blue are marked graves, that is, graves that have an existing marker. What you see in pink is everything that we called out as an unmarked grave. Hopefully, you can see that from where you're sitting. But it's fairly stunning in that, if you recall from that previous slide, it looks like, oh, there's lots of open areas here. This should be easy to, to find new burial space. But what we see actually is, is much more complicated than that, in that there are, there are a lot of people home already here. So in this case, I can't say for certain what the cemetery congregation or group has done with this, whether or not they are continuing to bury here. But in, in our recommendations, we suggested that they strongly consider whether or not to continue burying folks here. This hopefully looks familiar by now, but some examples of the, of the GPR profiles. These, these graves stand out really well. These are marked graves in this case. Here's some of the more subtle unmarked graves, but you see those hyperbolic reflections. And this is why we have to look at these, the profiles, as well as the 3D data, because they are very subtle in many cases. Another example from here in Raleigh, this is the Baptist Grove Cemetery on the northwest side of Raleigh. Very similar situation. We were asked by the, by the church to come in and help them identify new burial areas. On the left, here's the GPR survey area. I know you can't see the individual markers at that scale. This is a map showing the marker locations. Again, pay attention here to the large open spaces. There is a large open space here as well. So the, in this case, the church congregation expected that they would have lots of room to bury additional people. I'll get to that in a moment. But again, these look familiar by now. A couple of uh, shots of 3D data and then the profiles. Oops. But looking at the results from the GPR survey, again, what you see is not what you get below the ground. Individual markers are shown here in orange. The, all the graves, both marked and unmarked, are shown here in blue. We didn't actually symbolize them whether, by whether or not they were marked in this case. But this should give you a pretty good idea fairly quickly that 
in this area that looks today to be open, it's essentially full. And this happens to be the oldest section of that particular cemetery. So that doesn't surprise me at all. I've seen that pattern many times. The congregation was somewhat surprised at how many folks were actually there. And they had some hard decisions to make about whether or not to continue burying folks in that particular area. And this is my last example here. This is a, a project we did in Henry County, Georgia for the Georgia Department of Transportation. In this case, there's a DOT maintenance area here. They want to do some development out in front here. They knew there was a cemetery there. They didn't know much about it. There's one marked grave. So came through the GPR again. Looking at a couple of different slice maps here. These are all high amplitude reflections. And I know it's hard to see, but these turned out to be individual graves here. They're arranged in rows. No markers whatsoever in this case. So there's no indication at all from the surface that there's a cemetery here, other than one commemorative marker roughly in the center here. And it's, it's more appropriately a cenotaph because it's not actually marking a grave. So we analyzed the data, mapped all those, all those points, and we came up with two very distinct clusters with a few isolated probable graves in between those and felt good about that because they, they, they look like graves and found out after the fact, we did not know this ahead of time, that 25 or 30 years ago, somebody else had done some backhoe work in that area where they had stripped, they knew there was a cemetery there, they had stripped it. And they found two clusters of graves, which you see on this map. And I, I realize the contrast is low here. These clusters match up perfectly with the two clusters that we identified. So it, for, for us, it did two things. It was essentially a blind test. We had no idea at the time we did the survey that that work had been done previously, and we didn't know what the results were, so we had no idea that, they were, that the anomalies we identified were actually graves, but it turns out that they were. And it's, it's reassuring for me to know that in the situation where we, were, we essentially had a blind test and we didn't know on the front end what was there, that the data sets that we looked at and the results we came up with did match what was actually verified archaeologically in the ground. So, I'll start to wrap this up here. Just thinking about cemeteries, I, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but there, there's always more than meets the eye in terms of a cemetery. And in, in my experience, it doesn't matter if it's a small family cemetery with two markers or if it's a large municipal cemetery, say, with 55,000 markers, that what's above ground almost never reflects what's below ground. And they're much more complicated resource type than, than most of us recognize. In cemeteries, it's possible to produce precise, precise mapping. We can look at feature patterning. There are research questions specific to GPR, such as uh, changing burial depths. We can look at burial container. We can look at how those things may have changed through time. If you look, think about the attribute data that we can get from the markers, there are any number of social and economic and ethnic variables that affect burial patterns. We can look at demographic changes through time. There's a um, it provides information about changing attitudes of, about death. This is, you start thinking more about social anthropology or social history. I haven't done a lot of that myself, but the data sets are there to do that. And on, a, on the more practical side, we can help identify open areas for additional interments. And I believe that's all I have formally, so I'll be happy to entertain or answer any questions to the best of my ability. Thank you. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, what kind of limitations do above ground objects, vegetation, heavy, heavy forestation, tree roots, uh, foundations, uh, what kind of limitations do above ground intrusions pose to GPR? That's an excellent question, and we, we get that one a lot, and I typically spend a lot of time talking about that. There, there are two major challenges to obstructions on the surface. One is that Obstructions on the surface, whether it's vegetation or buildings or even fences or plot boundaries, any of those types of objects, create a physical barrier to data collection. That is, it's more difficult to collect the data because we have to work around them or we have to do short transects in front of a wall and then pick up the transect on the back of the wall so we end up with gaps in the data. That's one challenge. The second challenge is somewhat specific to tree roots and vegetation in that those those root systems below the ground retain water, and those are imaged in the GPR data sets. So we will, we will typically pick up those and see those. It becomes difficult on the, on the processing and interpretation side to be able to say with 
with very high confidence in most cases whether or not we're looking at tree roots or graves. And so oftentimes when I'm asked to look at a cemetery that's heavily wooded or that has dense vegetation on it, I will say maybe GPR is not the best option here because of that limitation. That it's, if you recall from the opening talk, that grave features are very subtle to begin with in the ground. They're hard to detect under ideal circumstances. They're harder to detect when the, when the conditions are worse. So tree roots really pose a problem unless the graves are buried below the root systems, and they're very obvious. In those cases, we can typically see them. So physical obstructions to data collection, and we will, the instruments will pick up tree root systems in the data sets, and we have to, quote, unquote, filter those out. There's no, there's no processing step or button I can push in the software program that will say, zap all the tree roots and show me the graves. I wish that were the case. It really comes down to us in terms of what we understand about how geophysical data are imaged and collected and what we expect graves to look like in that data set. Well, just for the folks online, if they can't hear you, it'll work. Thank you. Two simple things. Um, is the width of the scan that you can take in the ground equal to the width of the instrument that you're driving? And is the is, is GPR able to distinguish metal from stone, from wood? What are the distinguishing capabilities? Okay, those are very good questions. The first question is the, the width of the signal when it comes out of the instrument. And I'll, I'll simplify this a little bit because there's a lot of complicated physics involved in the underlying that. But essentially, the, the energy comes out in a cone from the antenna. And at a certain point in the ground, there's a formula that, that other folks have used to calculate where that radius of the cone expands beyond the width of the antenna. But it does expand beyond the width of the antenna. That expands the width depth. So that relates to the transect spacing that we typically use when we're collecting GPR data. In, in all, most cases, we're using half meter spacing, which is maybe a foot or foot and a half. In, in rarer cases, we'll cut that down to a quarter meter spacing, which is where we really want to have the highest resolution possible in terms of the data. But the, the reason we use a half meter is because of the formulas involved to figuring out where that overlap is in the cone of energy as it comes out from the antenna. So at a half meter, at roughly 40 centimeters down, we know that we're getting overlapping data. But we're missing some overlapping data above that, but in most cases for cemetery applications, the graves will be deeper than that anyway. So that hopefully answers your first question. Second question is, how, is there a way to tell from GPR data what different material types look like in the ground? I'll give a qualified yes and say that metal in particular is easy to pick out, and that's because when the energy hits the metal, it cannot pass through. So it bounces back to the antenna, and it creates a reverberation effect. And I, I had a slide earlier, I, don't, I won't be able to find it now, where I, I didn't point it out, but there was a slide in there that showed some metal. And when you see metal in a, in a GPR profile, it rings through the entire profile all the way down to the bottom. And it's always banded, and in every case I can say, that's metal for sure. Well, what's harder to do is to distinguish between wood or stone, and there really is no way to do that from the GPR data set alone. We have to look at, we have to make our best interpretation about those kinds of questions based on the geometry of the reflections. Is it visible in more than one profile? And then how does it look in, in plan view? So it's a little more complicated to get to that. Metal, though, does show up very well because of the way the energy is, is bounced back. I was just curious as to whether this uh, technique was used uh, in efforts to move uh, cemeteries. Yes, yes, we, we have done that a few times where, I, I'll be generic here and say, let's, um, an individual or an organization wants to move a cemetery or needs to move a cemetery, maybe needs is the, is the right word, for some public purpose. We may be asked to come in and conduct a GPR survey prior to that to see how many graves are actually there, that helps with all, all aspects of planning. That helps with obviously estimating the cost for what it will actually take in terms of dollars to move those, those graves, but also in terms of uh, working with the public and descendant communities about how many folks might be there, whether or not they're unmarked graves. So yes, we, we do that on a regular basis. And then I've also been asked a few times to look at reinterment areas where the new graves need to go. If they're going in an existing cemetery, as hopefully everyone knows by now, what you see is not what you get. If someone says, well, this portion of the cemetery over here doesn't have any markers on it, therefore we can put people here, 
That's not always the case. So GPR is useful in that situation to look at the potential reburial area to make sure that there's no one there as well. So we do it in, in both cases. Um, beyond the publicly funded development projects that will do these surveys, um, is there much of a problem with uh, unmarked cemeteries and graves getting disturbed in like private development and how common is that? That's a, that's a good question. I'll, I'll only partially answer that because there are people in this room who could answer that better than me in terms of, the, in terms of say, state law or, or best practices. But cemeteries are covered under state law. There are two different statutes that deal with those, and depending on whether they're marked or unmarked. And I don't, I don't want to get into the nuances of those because, again, there are folks in this room who are, who are better suited to answer that than me. But in short, my understanding is that a person or individual or organization cannot knowingly disturb a cemetery. You can't go out and knowingly remove the markers. You can't go out and, and grade it in the middle of the night to, quote, unquote, make the problem go away. You know, you, you're, those are, that's against the law. You cannot do that. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but yes, it's covered by state law. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry? I was just curious if there was much of like a sort of compliance issue of, you know, I'm just curious if, uh, if, if you encounter a lot of sort of stories Do we of, see that a lot? of these You're, things, you know, yes. not going okay. the way they should. Or yeah, <laughs> um, I, yes. Yes, we get, we get a fair number of phone calls on an annual basis about a situation like that where either, let's just say, an, an organization wants to disinter and they will ask us prior to, to help them figure out how many grapes there. That's, we do that on a regular basis. There have been a few other cases over the years where we've been asked to come in after the fact where someone has already done something that maybe they shouldn't have done. I'm not, I'm not passing judgment. I'm simply say, stating the facts. In that case, we may be asked to help identify how many graves were impacted or are there still graves there that might still be impacted. So yes, it does happen. It shouldn't happen in an ideal world, but it does happen. Does that answer your question? OK, you're welcome. Sean, in the pictures of the baby land, not the pictures, but the profiles, I was trying to catch the centimeter or the meters that, it, yes. that the burials were. It seemed that they were a lot more shallow than six feet under. That's, that's a good observation, Renee, yes. So a couple of, a couple of points on that. No, oh, I've gone too far. Yeah, so I'll, I'll answer that in a couple of different ways. Thank you for bringing it up. All of us, I'm sure, have heard the term six feet under. Again, in my experience, I'm only, I'm only talking about my experience here, that's almost never the case. In any cemetery where I've ever worked with a GPR, I rarely see graves that are that deep. They're usually much shallower than that. They tend to be in the three to four foot range. But there are cases where even here, where this is, a, this is an, a meter over here, so that's a meter. These are less than a meter. These are fairly shallow. There's lots of variability in, in the depths at which people are buried historically. One of the questions that I have had over time that I have not yet answered is, is it time sensitive or are there other variables involved? In this case specifically, I suspect it's, it's an issue of convenience and cost in that if this pauper section of individuals, again, I'm not passing judgment on anyone, I'm simply suggesting that it's less costly to dig a grave shallower than it is to actually dig it deep. But we rarely see them at six feet down. That's, that's almost, almost unheard of in terms of the GPR data sets that we've, we've looked at over the years. I'm curious to know in your experience with uh, going through and cataloging specifically headstones with names, have you had any kind of direct access to updating, um, I would say, like cemetery records and public records of deaths? Have you seen that this directly helps update outdated records? records of death and things? It's a good question. We, we have not done that personally. It's typically outside the scope of the work that we're asked to do. But the data sets that we're generating could easily be used to do that. So, so the answer is that we haven't done it ourselves, or I haven't done it personally. But the data sets can do that. They have the ability to, to update those records, certainly. Unfortunately, the, the hard part with, with the with a cemetery situation like that, where we want to map the markers and inventory them, it's, it's labor intensive. It takes a lot of time to go through, and maybe not so much the mapping. We, we have expedited ways to do that now, so we're, we're better at that, and we can be more efficient with it. 
But in terms of the marker inventory itself, there's still no substitute for actually walking around. You, so someone has to physically go to each marker and either take a photograph of it or enter the data in some kind of database while they're looking at it. And that, that takes time. And I can just take my personal experience over the summer working on my own time in my hometown. I had, I had several volunteers with me who I understood the technology quickly, and I, I had very high aspirations and goals and expectations that we would knock out 1,200 graves in, in two days. We'd be done, and you know, that would be it. The reality hit me pretty quickly that when you, when you actually get out there, when you're looking at graves from, say, 1790 or the markers, they've undergone 200 years of erosion, and the markers are oftentimes illegible. And so all my hopes that we would do this quickly and we could record the names and death dates and we could move on, it didn't work out that way. We had to use mirrors to reflect the sunlight back onto the, onto the markers at different angles so we could actually see the contrast. Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging to do it that way. That's the, so it takes time to, to fully inventory a cemetery like that. Okay. I have one specific question. We have a small family cemetery on a piece of property we used to live on that has been desecrated, maybe inadvertently, maybe not. That's probably not the question, but there are two... Three, three stones in there all have their inscriptions. Well, two of the, all the stones have the inscriptions facing east. Two of the footstone initialed inscriptions are facing east, but one of the footstones is facing west back toward the headstone. And I wondered if you'd... I learned somewhere along the way about the religious tradition of facing east and wondered if there's any significance to one of those sets of markers facing toward each other inward with the footstone facing west? That's an interesting question, and I don't have a good answer for you on that one. What I, what I can tell you again from personal experience is that there's a lot of variability in, in terms of those types of features. I don't know if they're significant or not. They may have been significant at the time to the person who did that. It may have been purely accidental. I don't, I don't have a good answer for you on that one. I, I wish I could answer that better. But you're, you're correct in that there, there are some patterns we see in cemeteries in, in terms of the orientation of the graves. It's typically east-west. That's the most common pattern. There are always variations on that. And it's almost never perfectly east-west because most folks in 1860 or 1920 didn't go out with a compass and actually lay them out that way. And hopefully you saw some of that come through in the different examples I showed. So, but yes, typically the, the orientation of the grave is on the east, is to the east, and the marker inscription is on the east side. In the, in the Vermont example that I, that I didn't have to show in detail, the one I did this summer, in most cases, say 80 or 90 percent, the markers were on the west side. I mean, the epitaphs were on the west side. And that seems to be a, something that's peculiar to that area because it's very different than the data sets I've seen in this part of the world. So, so I'm sorry I can't answer your question directly. It may have been personal preference, idiosyncrasy. It could have, been, could have been an accident. Maybe they didn't intend to do it that way. Maybe the marker got displaced at one time. Somebody well-meaning put it back without thinking about the orientation of the, of the initials on that. Well, on behalf of the Office of State Archaeology, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Patch for coming and uh, talking, to, talking to us today. You're welcome. I'll, I'll hang around for a few minutes. If anybody wants to stay and talk, I'll be happy to, happy to hang out. Yeah. Thank you. I'd also like to thank everybody for showing up today, and for those of you joining us online, thank you. Um, please keep an eye out for future lectures, um, and please check our website, uh, archaeology.ncdcr.gov, each month for new updates. So thank you very much.